two pragmatic statements. First one, uh, you will find a study uh, promoting either one of these techniques for, for focal liver lesion detection, um, depending on where it's published. In the world of ultrasound, it's always contrast and hunt ultrasound winning. And in the journal of MRI, it's MRI. Now, a second pragmatic statement is, um, is that really important? Because normally what happens is, even if you have a very dedicated, ambitious, and, and passionate contrast-enhanced ultrasound person as we have, then this person will forward the patient anyways to a secondary uh, imaging modality. And the question is more, what's the second imaging modality that you would like to promote? And I'll show you what I believe that should be. But I really, I either need support or a different machine here. Um, since I'm going to be flipping through that presentation, if there is a chance you, you get me a second handle, that would help a lot probably. Now, just to give you some, some idea, this is a CT, and maybe not, not too bad to have a little time to look at that CT, because I see as much as you do. It's a, it's a well-done CT, technically, and the left liver lobe looks a little fancy, maybe, but not really. And if you look at the MRI, next slide, please then you will see that there is a diffuse tumor infiltration both in the hepatobiliary imaging as well as T2 imaging. Thank you. Um, the upper being the hepatobiliary imaging, the other the T2 imaging, and that's not quite rare. The next slide, please. This is a patient with breast cancer, and the next slide with the computer tomography done at the same time point, very important, as the, uh, as the MRI that I'm going to show you in the next slide. There is not much to see on the CT. There's a bit to see, but not much. And if you look here, everything that's black in that hepatobiliary imaging, um, that is tumor in a breast cancer patient. And the message behind those two patients is both of those patients were scheduled for radioembolization. If you radioembolize a patient with that tumor extent and the diffuse infiltration, the patient is going to die for liver decompensation very soon. So this is a very, very important step in the workup of radioembolization patients. And not only think of surgery you would like to do, this is the patient where you do a laparotomy and you close again. Next slide, please. Now, to understand MRI, basically MRI has been introduced to, uh, to, to confuse the clinicians and to, to keep the technique with the radiologist. So MRI is much more complicated, but it offers lots of possibilities. This is in-phase and out-of-phase imaging. And the black that you see on the left here, that is basically the, uh, the uh, steatotic arena of that liver. The next, please. You can see dynamic imaging, that's the middle row, that's what you know from CT, the different phases of the contrast enhancement. You see the artery there, you see the portal vein down there, and then you see the venous, uh, venous outflow. That's dynamic imaging as you know it. Then we have T2-weighted imaging for the anatomic depiction. And very important, very interesting, I get into details in a bit, is diffusion-weighted MRI. And then, next slide please, hepatobiliary MRI, applying hepatobiliary contrast agent, namely gadozetate as the generic. Next please. Next slide please. Now, diffusion weighted, to understand diffusion weighted imaging takes weeks and months, at least it took a long time for me. I, just, I won't give you a training course now, but the next time you look at your tea bag, once you have the time to sit down and relax, Think of MRI, think of diffusion-weighted MRI, because nothing different from your tea bag in a pot of hot water is diffusion-weighted MRI. You will see that diffusion of the tea, whatever it is, in your hot water. Next slide, please. And what you have, what we do in MRI, is we read out the voxels, the areas of interest, in a given volume with those different, um, different entities in there. We have very rapid proton movements, we read out, that's in the, in the vessels, uh, that's very rapid. We have it slower in the extracellular space where the protons can move freely, more or less freely. And then there is the intracellular space where the protons move very, very slowly because there's not enough space and you now it's easy to imagine. Still, all of this is extremely slow, and once again, consider we're measuring proton movement with that MRI. Next slide, please. There is those strange B values that may have come across. They just identify um, a technical move, a physical move in that, to eliminate rapid 
proton movements. What you do when you increase the Beal value is you decrease the signal of rapidly flowing protons. What we see here is, and I wish I could show you, but the pointer doesn't work either. However, if you look at the vessels with the low B value of zero, you will see vessels as well as the movement here in, in some lesions in the liver. Next, please. With a higher B value, this, the rapid movement of the protons in the vessels disappears, but we still see the rather rapid movement elsewhere. And even higher then, we lose all the protons. The next slide, please all the protons in those different areas, except for the one that we see here. And this is still not decisive. What you need is another mathematical trick to get rid of artifacts. That's the, uh, the strange ADC map, the next slide please, which is the apparent diffusion coefficient. This is a parametric image where the slope of signal against B value is turned into a gray value in a given voxel or in a given position on that slide. And what you see here, just as a rule of thumb, you see that bright uh, lesion that we also had on those B value images, it's still there, rule of thumb. If it is bright, it's a cyst. If it is black, it's a tumor, or even an abscess with a lot of cell density. Next slide, please. And what does that do? The boring part, to be honest, is lesion detection because there is things that are probably better. This here is the study that compared diffusion-weighted MRI to the gold standard, which is hepatobiliar imaging. I'll get to that in a minute. And usually diffusion-weighted images loses against hepatobiliar imaging because it's very sensitive to motion, specifically in the left liver lobe. It's very difficult due to heart motion. But if you combine diffusion-weighted imaging with hepatobiliary imaging, the rate of lesion detection is highest. Next slide, please. Much more interesting to all of us is therapeutic monitoring. This is a study of gastrointestinal cancer, liver metastases of those being followed under chemotherapy at two weeks and 12 weeks. Uh, by diffusion-weighted imaging. 85 patients, 156 lesions, and interestingly, Two weeks, 12 weeks. Next slide, please. What you see, what's not surprising, we have a clear discrimination here. The control basically is tumor size. What you see is an effective group, an ineffective group. In the effective group, you have the tumor shrinkage after 12 weeks, not after two weeks. And in the ineffective group, you, know, you don't have tumor shrinkage. So that's our comparator. Next, please. What you see here is the ADC values. And to cut a long story short, with the ADC value, even at two weeks, this group was able to show a highly significant, this is a p-value of zero, a highly significant change in the ADC values if the treatment was effective. Next slide, please. So that is the interesting part about diffusion-weighted imaging. It's a good adjunct to hepatobiliary imaging for lesion detection. And it's something with very high potential but hasn't been validated enough for therapeutic monitoring for therapeutic response. And therapeutic response to chemotherapy after two weeks, I think that would be worth a lot if we had a positive outcome on that. Now, hepatobiliary imaging, that's gadozetate or primovist or eovist in some countries, um, that is a contrast agent that has a mixed excretion via the renals for 50% and via the hepatobiliary tract um, at another 50%. Next slide, please. And the key word here is the OATP as the transporter mechanism which needs to be expressed in the liver and the hepatocytes to allow for the uptake of the gadozetate. Next slide, please. The plain image on top and the late phase hepatobiliary image uh, down there. And you can see that the liver is bright now. That is what happens when the gadozetate is taken up by functional hepatocytes. Dysfunctional hepatocytes or non-hepatocyte tissue in the liver will not take up the contrast agent. Next, please. Now, this is a 74-year-old male, uval melanoma, question liver meds. If you look closely, I haven't seen liver meds, but what happens? Next slide, please. If you add the hepatobiliary late phase, this is a quite common finding that we find at least more tumors in the liver. It's normally not as expressive as here where the, the tumor is not visible at all before, but 
this is also something very, very common finding. There's going to be more tumors, and there is, next slide, data on that too. First of all, this is a study here. It comes from uh, Korea for the combination of the hepatobiliary imaging with dynamic MRI or dynamic MRI at all, or C alone, or CT. And what you find is close to 100% lesion depiction if you combine your MRI with the, uh, with the hepatobiliary MRI. Next slide, please. There is a prospective multicenter trial being published in 2014. That's the upper uh, quote here. And uh, a, um, uh, a, 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 an assessment of the costs of that, of, of the outcome um, trial called the value trial and the results show us. Next slide, please. Something very interesting, multi-center trial, global, 40 centers. Um, what happens if you start with the CT or the standard MRI or the Primovis, the Gadositate MRI for the decision for liver surgery? So you start with the CT and how often would you go out and say, I need another CT, uh, sorry, I need another imaging modality? And that was the case in 40% of patients. If you started with the standard MRI with the extracellular contrast agent, then that was the case in 18% and was almost never necessary to add additional information when you started with the hepatobiliary contrast agent. And the next slide shows you the results of that economic study um, as relative costs worldwide. You can see this is from Austria to Thailand. Everywhere, the costs will be about equal, however you start, even though the costs, obviously, for the MRI are higher, specifically when you're using the hepatobiliary contrast agent. But that's weighted out by the fact that you would have to increase uh, the number of examinations you're doing when you start with the wrong modality. Next slide, please. Next, please. And there are some inf interesting, very interesting uh, properties when we come to liver cirrhosis and HCC depiction. This is the standard washout, you're probably all aware. You have uh, arterial hyperperfusion and a washout in the venous phase. This is clearly a uh, hepatocellular carcinoma with a specificity of more than 97%. Next slide, please. It gets interesting when you have a strongly cirrhotic liver. Next, please with all these nodules, and it's very hard to depict in such a liver, if, is it a regenerative nodule, a dysplastic nodule, with a potential as a pre-malignancy, or is it overt HCC? Next slide, please. Now, I already mentioned OATP, the transport mechanism for the uptake of the gadositate, the EOB DTPA, and the, you can see there's a very strong correlation between the expression of that OATP and the uh, gadositate uptake. Next slide, please. There is also a very close correlation between the expression of OATP and hepatocarcinogenesis on the... Thank you. And uh, what you see here is that from low-grade dysplastic nodule over high-grade dysplastic nodule to an over HCC, the expression of OATP goes down dramatically. And this is what we can see in the images. What you see here, and I hope you can see, depict that lesion there in segment five to six, uh, on the far left image, that bright spot, that's a stereototic lesion, hyperperfused in the arterial images, but it doesn't have washout. So what do we do with this? If you take up the, uh, the hepatobiliary imaging, there is a faint washout, not a washout, but it, there is no uptake of that, um, of that gadositate, indicating the OATP expression is going down. This is a high-grade dysplastic nodules with hepatocellular carcinoma islets in it. And another example, and this is our real problem, hypoperfused HCC. Up to 39% of HCCs are hypoperfused in the range of one to two centimeters. And they're only visible on the left image, which is the hepatobiliary contrast agent. And there is clinical proof that this is malignancy. So there is a study here um, that showed in 49 patients or 49 lesions the fate uh, of those hypoperfused non-uptake tumors in the liver. So no hyperperfusion, but only visible in hepatobiliary imaging or faint washout in the venous phase. And if they are larger than 15 centimeters, the likelihood to be malignant, to turn into a hypervascularization, and then to turn out to be malignant is almost 80%, if more than 
1.5 centimeters. And if it's smaller than 15 millimeters, um, the likelihood of turning into malignancy is only 16%. Another example, up to uh, the fourth image, this looks like a regenerative nodule, but on the last image, which is the hepatobiliary contrast agent image, you can see that large nodule that does not express OATP, does not take up the gadozetate, at least most parts of it. This to me, this looks like a dysplastic nodule with, with HCC in it, with different or heterogeneous expression of OATP. The biopsy was high-grade dysplastic nodule. The resection revealed large islets of HCC in a high-grade dysplastic nodule. And now just a small comment after rushing through what's emerging in diagnostics, maybe treatment uh, or therapeutic decisions in hepatobiliary contrast agent and diffusion-weighted MRI. This is the future of MRI, I suppose. This is MR fluoroscopy. Now we're starting to do the interventions in the MRI, replacing CT, replacing sonography. Uh, you can see the needle going in there, and I still, very unfortunately, don't have a pointer. I'll try it like that. You can see the needle going in there under fluoroscopy. You're going to forward the needle, and you're going to open the umbrella of the RF system, as you can see here. This is done as if you were using your MRI as an ultrasound machine, basically. The, the colored images here that show you the temperature map that is evolving when you start your uh, ablation. And what you see here is the scar with the safety margin around the tumor when you have retracted the RF needle still under MR fluoroscopy. There are studies going on like this one, comparing image guidance, and I'm quite convinced we're going to see a strong um, advantage for the MR guidance in that respect. So in summary, MRI, specifically when you're including diffusion-weighted imaging and hepatobiliary imaging, is superior for lesion detection and characterization. Diffusion MRI has strong potential for therapy monitoring, and there's one very important thing here. I urge you, because it's, it's you who decide that, insist on applying diffusion-weighted imaging, diffusion-weighted MRI in randomized controlled trials of systemic chemotherapy as some secondary endpoint, because this could be something extremely interesting for therapeutic monitoring in the future. Hepatobiliary imaging of hepatocarcinogenesis offers new options for therapeutic guidance in HCC. And MRI is definitively the future of interventional oncology. Thank you very much.